So I stand welcome to Pastor Lady Clark. You don't need me to tell you our nation is in trouble. And one of the interesting dynamics of God's sovereignty is that he chooses to respond to his people when there are troubled times. Always he has had this disposition that if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive your sin and heal your land. It, it's come to my attention recently that there have been several significant religious figures in this country who have been brought to ruin by hidden sin. If judgment is going to begin, it's going to begin in the house of God. Because if there's not an alternative to what's outside the house of God, then there is no light in the land. I'd like to ask you to stand with me and let us pray for our nation and to give ourselves to a season of reflection in the Lord for those things that only the Holy Spirit can identify that might reside within us. But this is a time of tremendous importance in the history of this nation. And what will be taking place on the other side of this upcoming election, no man can see clearly, but many prognosticate. Let us appeal to the Lord that in spite of our wicked ways, that he would have mercy upon us as a nation. Father, as your representatives in the earth, we appeal to you that in the chaos that is overflowing the boundaries of every nation, that in your grace and compassion, in the nature that is yours, that you are slow to anger, that you abound in loving kindness, that you keep mercy for thousands, that you forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin. We appeal to you, Lord, the God who has defined himself in that merciful way to show us mercy and to grant to us, Lord, the clarity of heart, mind, and spirit that allows each individual who calls upon your name to align themselves with your purpose in this hour. We pray, Father, that you would stem the hand of violence so many evil things have been brought and welcomed into this land. We ask that you would do warfare on our behalf, that we might be strong in the power of your might, and that in a place of humility before you, you would raise up a standard against the flood that has come upon us. I pray, Lord, that in our Father's house, you would bring to us a fresh understanding of who we are to be as your representatives in the earth. And that those things that oppose alignment with you, you would bring to our quiet attention and adjust our hearts and give us the courage to step forward into things to which you've appointed us. This I appeal, Lord, even as we pray for those in authority over us who walk in darkness because they are not part of the light. May those, Lord, who are part of your kingdom in those spheres of influence begin to walk in a measure of wisdom and revelation that profounds and dumbfounds. Let your grace come upon us, I pray, together with these in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, whatever happens, Jesus Christ is still Lord. There are a couple of things I want to begin with this morning <clears throat> that uh, might require us to look more carefully 
at uh, what I want to address across the board, but to tie something up from the last time I was with you and to move us forward into today, I thought it might be good for us to review something fairly historical. You may have heard of this, even if you can't remember what it says, but um, once upon a time, there was something called the Ten Commandments, way before there was a movie starring Charleston Heston. And I'd like us to review those for a moment and uh, maybe with fresh eyes see things we've overlooked along the way. For instance, from uh, <clears throat> the book of Exodus, some of you will recall that's in the Bible, chapter 20. I'm going to take the long version here. Now, these Ten Commandments, the first four relate to our relationship to God and the last six to our relationship to others. But God spoke all these words saying this, <clears throat> I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth, and you shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Now, recently I had opportunity to tell you that the translation of let us make man in our image and in our likeness is better translated, let us make man as our image and in our likeness. Now, if that be true, would God want his image kneeling before something else? See, sometimes we can't grasp right away what we're looking at because we lack context. But showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. There should be a Sabbath day in your life. How many of you know Sunday is not my Sabbath day? Okay. Now, we have migrated into things over time because God continues in his progressive revelation. But even your doctor will tell you, you need a day off because the accumulation of seven days a week will shorten your life. So you need to find a place of Sabbath. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or the sojourner who stays with you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, and he rested on the seventh. Therefore, he blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, honor your father and mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. I've come to understand that honoring your father and mother is unto the Lord, even if they are not. And when you are the recipient of the pain of that pair, you can't see what is taking place. But I've shared with you before, God takes everything that happens and makes it of value in his hand. Whatever your suffering has been, God knows there's another group of people who have suffered just like you. And his intention is to heal you from your pain and make you a testimony to those who have not yet escaped their pain. So I can look back on the abuses I've suffered and thank God because he prepared me for the places to which I'm deployed. You can't see that when you're on the receiving end. You shall not commit murder. If, an, if everyone is made in the image and likeness of God, who is it you're killing? Commit adultery. If marriage is the image of Christ in the church, what is being defiled? You shall not steal. Because if God is your provider, why do you have to take it into your own hand? Neither 
shall you bear false witness against your neighbor? Because if God is truth, should we not be people of truth? These things are still relevant, even if you can't cite them. Now, ladies, I want you to notice this. You shall not cover your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that what? Belongs to your neighbor. <clears throat> There's a stream of rabbinic thought that takes this 10th commandment and makes women property. I still run into this problem globally where women are treated like property. I dealt with that the last time I spoke to you, but I wanted you to see from which it originates. Even in the Christian community, there are places where chauvinism is now Christianized so that women are still treated like property. Much of it flows from here. But what I want to look at as we move it back into Ephesians chapter 6 is the one with promise. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. So guess what Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1 says? Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. If, if any of you have not been in Ezekiel chapter 18 lately, you might want to go look at it. <clears throat> because in it, God declares he's not, he's not happy when anyone dies, righteous or unrighteous. Because long life is supposed to be a blessing. Someone was sharing with me just this past week that their 95-year-old father is starting to fail. 95 years old. That's called a blessing. So, live long and prosper. <laughs> Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters, do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours in heaven, and there's no partiality with him. Now then, <clears throat> I want to take this passage and, and try to unpackage it a little bit because we don't often get a chance to see the kingdom on display. Remember, when we began the book of Ephesians, we started with the king on down, and now we're getting down into the grass. Here we are, we've passed through the, the marriage situation and the imagery of Christ in the church, and now we're looking at both our personal and professional lives and the responsibility the scripture details for us in this. Do you remember? Ah, uh, that's unfair. Let me just repeat it. I spent some time with you the last time we were together talking about the need to reverence the Christ in one another because we are all members of his body and that we are to voluntarily submit ourselves to one another as unto the Lord. And in that demonstration, we put something that is alternative to most of what you see. In your work environment, can you see the pecking order? Can you see those who cluster together against those who haven't found a cluster? We should be something that's alternative to that because we represent someone. His presence in another requires our reverence for the other. And it doesn't matter if they've just come in off the street, if they've, if they've walked in from immorality and are still pregnant out of wedlock, or if they're still trying to figure out how to work with their hands rather than steal like they have all their life, or if they're still working on their language because they've, they've not been in the kingdom. It doesn't matter. Once Christ is in them, 
There's a deference that must be paid to the Christ that is in them while we move them forward into the maturation process of the Spirit. To live in voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility, and carrying a burden is an atmosphere and an attitude. When you have that attitude, we create that atmosphere. Now, <clears throat> this address to children, let's get something straight. <clears throat> I have heard this passage of scripture used to disqualify people from ministry. I've actually heard pastors with grown children say that, well, if their child ever went into a sin or divorced or immorality, I'd be disqualified from ministry. That's nonsense. Technon, little children, obey your parents. Now, who teaches a child to obey their parents? The parent does. When the grandpa can help, I guarantee you that. Obey your parents in the Lord, which is to say that in the appeal to conscience that we'll talk about in a moment, a child has to be developed in the moral understanding. We have uh, access to families who are just really, really uninstructed in parenting. And it shows up in what we have to deal with in the children. There's no boundaries. There's no discipline. There's no character development. There's no respect and honor for the parents. We work on this very hard, both in our ministry here and through Riversong. And quite frankly, it's difficult to teach a child to obey the parents if you don't have the parent's support. Okay? Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Now... Small children need to be responsive to you immediately. Why? Because of safety concerns, all right? How many of you know children are attracted to electrical outlets? That's why we have those little plastic guards. <clears throat> but ant heels? Moving traffic, sharp items, poisonous snakes, baby skunks, all represent harm. And that child needs to be able to respond like that. But if you train them, they don't have to respond until you count to three or 10 or five. That may be too late, okay? And it takes a while for them to recognize what your eyebrow might mean. But my boys learned. And from across the room, if they saw the eyebrow, you could watch their behavior alter just like that. Because they'd rather deal with the eyebrow than what supports it. You have to train them. Training a child is one of the primary obligations we have as young parents. Now, <clears throat> The next address is very, very important and a little bit problematic in our present situation. So let me say this to you single moms before I start this. It's not your fault you're a single mom. It's not your fault your ex-husband didn't know what he was supposed to be as a father and a husband. And so don't be excluded because in our father's house, we have got men who will embrace your children and stand with you in their development. How many of you ladies know that? So fathers... Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Now, when we look at the word discipline, don't think belt switch or, or board of education applied to the seat of knowledge, okay? Think in terms of the whole training of the child that relates to both the cultivation of the mind and the moral character you're trying to develop. And in that process, there is at one time a command, another time an admonition, another time a reproof, another time there might be punishment. Now, I use the wrong word, discipline. Punishment exists on the basis of the law. Discipline exists on the basis of love. 
Rarely would we need to punish our children. We disciplined them. It's very liberating for a parent to discover you can discipline your child for a bad attitude because the goal of discipline is to restore spirit to spirit relationship. When God disciplines you, what's he after? He wants you restored to him. So we use the word reproof. Do you know what a proof is in the photography industry? You know what a reproof is? It's when you make it better. I had a friend now deceased who worked for National Geographic Publications for a year, and he explained that whole process in boring detail to me one afternoon. But a reproof is something you do to take the picture and make it sharper. So when we're reproving a child, we are bringing them forward in clarity. It presumes, of course, you have some idea of where you're trying to take the child. It also includes, believe it or not, training and care of the body. You know, over the course of my, my tenure here, I've come in contact with parents who would let their child eat anything the child wanted. And it typically included larger size clothing. There are other parents who became sensitive to the fact that there are certain ingredients and in certain foods their child can't tolerate. And once they figure that out, they alter the dietary process of the child. Many of you are too young to remember JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. One of the things he did was embark the entire nation on physical fitness. Do you know you don't even have to go out on the playground anymore? You know, one of the things about me is I, I see a lot of stuff some of it makes an impression, even I don't remember what it's about. I can tell you the commercial, but I can't tell you what the commercial's about. So the little fat boy is sitting at the laptop, he picks up his cell phone, and he calls somebody. And you see Grandma on her walker, headed for the telephone. She goes, hello? And he's sitting over there, Grandma, could you bring me another soda? Train a child in the ways they should go. To instruct means simply to admonish. But it's in uh, the appeal to conscience, the will, and the reasoning facilities. Now, in order to help a child learn to think, you have to have a certain clarity in your own mind. It's not generally helpful to go, why did you do that? Because the moment you use the word why, what do you get? <laughs> what were you thinking when you did that? And that takes you back somewhere else. Because now we're engaging a process of motivation. They need to see it and you need to understand it. And it requires incredible patience. Incredible patience. But notice this address is to the fathers because the fathers in the economy of God are the ones who are going to be accountable to him for the nurture and development of those children. The wife is a helper, but in the economy of God, the man is the head and he's the one who's going to have to give an account for this stuff. So I recommend, guys, you start taking seriously the fact that righteous rule begins in your own household. Now, interestingly enough, righteous rule in your household is the thing that qualifies you for rule in the household of God. For those of you who haven't looked at it lately, 1 Timothy says this is a trustworthy statement. If any man desires the uh, position of overseer, he desires a good work. But in the list of qualifications, it says the man must be approached, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceful, free from the love of money, and he must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? I have a good friend 
who is engaged in uh, a certain measure of financial clarity. He's been trained in that regard. And he has uh, reported to me recently that he got engaged with the senior leadership of the thing that was called the Toronto Blessing. Now, no one in their organization has ever addressed the business side of ministry. And so they discovered, based on a paper he wrote, that he knows something about how to manage the finances of a church. So they've asked him to come train all of their leaders. I mean, even though that's a good thing. But it's like 25 years late. Management is a business issue. Remember when the scriptures talk about managing his own household, it was more than the nuclear family because extended families, it was not uncommon for a benefactor to have a large complex. Often he'd have many shopkeepers on the lower level. He would have servants, he would have fields, he would have herds. And he had to manage all of that. So when they talk about that, they're thinking about somebody at that magnitude. Down here, we talk about Financial Peace University. Just to help us escape the lack of financial intelligence that has characterized most of our development. Now, a good reputation outside the church should say something to us about our professional lives. You've heard me say this before, I'll repeat it again. If you're not making money for your employer, then he should probably get rid of you. I don't know if you guys know much about unions, but unions have been notorious for reducing production. Reducing production. Now, when you take that business outside the United States, guess what? Production is a whole new dynamic. In the course of my educational process, I had to read a lot about business. And one of the things that I found interesting was that there were a group of Detroit automobile workers who were sent to Japan to observe their production lines. And they, uh, they thought that they were just watching something that had been orchestrated for them. So what they decided to do was go back at night and see what was really going on in the factory they ran 24 hours a day. So they slipped in to watch the night shift and they were just as industrious as the day shift. They came back to America, they went back to their company and they said, listen boys, if we don't start producing, we're not going to have jobs. Your professional reputation is important because you represent somebody in that cubicle, in that oversight position, wherever it is you are. I, your boss should not come to your home and find his tools in your garage. And yet, billions of dollars and losses are passed on to us in prices because employees steal their bosses blind. We've actually had people in this congregation change jobs because they were being asked to violate their conscience and their integrity. And some of them did so at financial loss. But they were not willing to be pressured into becoming someone they didn't want to be. Does that make any sense? You have to have a certain sense of ethical uprightness about you in dealing with your business stuff. How many of you have ever heard of some financial scandal in a church? Hands all over the room. You're never going to hear that here. We have exacting requirements for the way we handle money. When, when I say to you this offering is for, every penny that we collect goes to what it's for. We have all kinds of safeguards in place to protect everyone involved from false accusation and any kind of mismanagement. Because basically, congregants don't care about the business side of the house until something goes wrong. And then everybody wants to know. And so we have all kinds of stuff in place to protect the reputation of everybody involved. This place has financial integrity. And Jay is going to see to it that it continues or I'll come hang him. Honoring Christ in our professions <clears throat> requires us to give 
certain deferences to the scripture. Now, how many of you ever felt like you were working like a slave? Good. Slaves, <clears throat> be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. Now, here's the issue of fear and trembling. It's not being afraid. This is what it means. It's the anxiety of one who distrusts his ability completely to meet all the requirements, but religiously does his utmost to fulfill his duty. Now, those of us who have military experience are aware that just about the time you feel like you've got your arms around your present assignment, they stick you in a bigger hole. So you're constantly hoping that you don't mess it up. And eventually, some of us make command because the managerial styles have been acquired, we see the mission, etc. But it's not necessary as a representative of the Lord that you retreat from the opportunity to be promoted because diligence in your job is unto the Lord, not just to the boss. I happen to be in a vocation where I routinely have the opportunity to feel unqualified for what I do. Just throw me into another culture and watch me start scrambling to get my head around it. You know, have God speak a word of knowledge that doesn't make any sense and have to deliver it publicly. You know, you're, you're either honoring the Lord or you're, you're retreating from it. But not by way of eye service as men pleasers. How many of you know what eye service is? How many of you know what busy work is? Now you're starting to get the picture. Back when I was aboard submarines, most of us electricians would hang out back in the switchboard. The switchboard was the place where you'd throw the levers that control the power plants. So if they wanted to go ahead two thirds, you just move these things. But there was always an electrician up in the control room standing watch. And whenever the engineering officer started heading aft, yeah, the boss is coming back, look busy. So we'd all grab a rag and start doing something. That's eye-pleasing. That's performance for perception, not for substantive production. You know anybody like that? The contrast to that is this. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. What time is knockoff on the base? Quitting time? Does anybody know? What time? No, I want the real time. I know when it starts. I'm just curious what the real time is. Four hours. Poor. Core hours. I see. So when traffic is headed out of there at one o'clock, I assume they're all on their way to the airport to do business. Ah, well, that's good to know. I'll adjust my attitude about the traffic that I see at two o'clock in the afternoon come pouring off that base. But if you want a day's wages, what should you give your boss? That's exactly right. And it's difficult as it might be to fathom this, the Lord actually pays attention to your work ethic. He actually notices who's representing him and who's not. What I find amusing about some recent regulations is you can't go in early, you can't stay late, you can't work on the weekend. Did y'all know that that got passed? It absolutely needs to be repealed. Yeah, I'm meddling. The issue of being a slave <clears throat> is a metaphor that basically says it's one who gives himself up to another's will. Paul says that I'm a slave of Christ. What does that mean? He has surrendered the right to live and rule his own life so that another can live and rule through his. So a slave comes into this scenario as one who is extending the influence of Christ and his kingdom in that sphere 
that vocational sphere. We get devoted to the benefit of another at the disregard of our own selves. Now, in, in the military, at least in the Navy portion of it, there were ways of evaluating people. And when you got through all the regular talk, there was PAC, PAC plus, and PAC minus. Does that mean anything? When you're looking at a group of junior officers, let's say you've got 11 lieutenants. The PAC plus are the top performers. The PAC minors are the ones that probably aren't going to get promoted. And the PAC is the place you have to break out from if you want promotion. Now, who are the PAC plus people? They're the devoted ones. They're the ones who go the extra mile. They don't leave at 4 o'clock because they see the vision and the mission for what they're doing, and they're committed to it. One of the uh, most, I have met three gloriously professional naval officers in my career. One was my first CO here at this base. The second was my CO when I became a reservist. And the third was the director of naval intelligence. The man was thoroughly devoted to the welfare of his country and I felt secure in his presence because I knew he'd give his life for our welfare. You may not have to give your life for your company, but you can give your life to your company to see that it excels. The problem we have with that is this. Well, I'll get to the problem in a moment. <clears throat> Paul makes some additional statements in Colossians that I think are more fully developed than what he says in Ephesians. So I'll read this to you out of Colossians 3. Verse 22, he says, Slaves in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. And whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. The story is told of this guy who's walking through a quarry and uh, there, there are men there chiseling out these big stones. And he asked the one guy, he says, well, what are you doing? He says, I'm just cutting stone, man, just cutting stone. And he, and he asked his fellow compatriot, well, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a great cathedral. It's all a matter about how you approach this thing. Did you know nobody can control your attitude but you? And did you know if it's not controlled, you hear things like this? What do you do? Get up on the wrong side of the bed? Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he's done, and that without partiality. Now, notice how he phrases this. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men. So who are you working for? Who are you representing? Now, when this got buried down in me decades ago, it transformed the way I went to work. It will reshape the way you see the environment. I, um, I was in a Starbucks not long ago, and I, I'm a people watcher. So while I'm standing there in line waiting, I'm just watching. There might have been six or seven servers working there not one of them had a smile on their face. Not a single one of them. And when they said, have a good day, they didn't mean it. Okay. In sharp contrast, within that same week, I was in a different location in a different Starbucks, and the entire crew was laughing and cutting up with one another, and things were just popping. Two different management styles, two different attitudes. Because part of the problem we have at work is the jerk for whom we work. Be quiet, Tim. <laughs> and so he says, and masters do the same things to them. 
give up threatening knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there's no partiality with him. Again, from Colossians, Paul amplifies, Masters, grant to your servants justice and fairness knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Now, I have, in the course of being here, sat with people who have been financially defrauded by their bosses. I've listened to their frustration as their supervisor took the credit for their work and their ideas to make themselves look good. Some folks climb the ladder carrying knives, and they go up other people's backs to get there. Grant to your servants justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master. Give up threatening. Grant justice and fairness to your employees, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. This is written to bosses. Now, if you're a supervisor or you run your own company, you need to pay attention to the fact that God expects you to rule righteously within that sphere. You know, I expected it to be quiet this morning because this is right down in your shoe leather. This is about the attitude you take into the teacher's lounge. It's about the way you conduct yourself at the coffee pot because if there's going to be an alternative in that environment, who's it going to be? You were once darkness, not merely in darkness. You were darkness, now you are light. You can't put the light out, but you decide whether or not the rheostat is up or down. Shall we have an altar call for repentance? These are sober things, but remember, they have a kingdom context. Our personal and our professional lives are an expression of the Christ in us on display to others, to our parents, to our children, to our co-workers, to our employers, to the people in the landscape, the checkout clerk. You know, somebody was telling me just this week that uh, after several weeks of frustration trying to get something done, they finally connected with the right person who got it done in, in the matter of an hour and a half. And so he wrote them a thank you note for their service. Somebody in a distant city serving him long distance. He got a phone call from this woman and she was in tears reading his thank you note because no one ever says thank you. Do you know what it is to live in a thankless environment? You personally, okay? Where you, you pour out your life and all they want is more of your life. Never a kind word, never a note, never a merit, what you call it, bonus. You don't have to be like that. And here's what I've discovered. If you're one of those folks, you attract people like fruit flies to the fruit basket. They like being around you because you're so encouraging. You're grateful. You see things in them that you can ascribe value to. And say, you know, man, I'm telling you what. Every time I look at you, I just get encouraged thinking that you're on my team because you do such and such so well. You know, boss, I watched that situation last week and I heard you on the phone call. I know they were yelling at you, but the way you kept your temper and handled that with profession really set a standard for me and I'm grateful to work for you. And none of that's hard. We need to be those little sprinkler systems that those people can run through and be refreshed. Wouldn't that be a good thing to practice this week? I have an idea. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You have got six days to give six people a compliment. How's that for an assignment? And if you can't do it, we need to work on you. But it's not hard. It's not that hard. 
Just look around. Some of you are going to go to a restaurant this afternoon. Get your first one done. I took somebody out last week, and we had stellar service. I mean, that girl was all on top of everything, and she had a beautiful servant spirit. She had a quick smile, a good sense of humor. She brought me the check, and I said, I'd like to see the manager. And she goes, did I do something wrong? I would like to see the manager. So she ran and got the manager, and he came over and said, I just want to commend the young lady serving us today. Not only does she have a wonderful attitude, a servant spirit, but she was on top of everything. We lacked for nothing. And she's standing over there behind him. And he said, well, thank you, sir, because that's what I look for when I'm hiring people. And I will make sure that she gets a kudo on the back board. Right? Now, I could have told her, no, you're not in trouble, but that, I'm just not fully redeemed yet. <laughs> And it was such a joy to watch relaxation come into her face and to watch him be affirmed for his hiring practices, which was a benefit, a side benefit, okay? If we will just look and pay attention, there are things we can see and do and say that put the Lord on display. So regardless where, where you are as a parent or a child or an employee or a boss, it's not too late to start changing. Because all along the way, God is looking to develop us. One of the most prosperous businessmen I have met in the Philippines, he's extremely successful. Multiple enterprises, very, very wealthy. In speaking with his employees, they used to refer to him as the Trinosaurus. Because when he got mad at an employee, not only was he yelling, he was throwing things. But he paid well, so they stayed. And then he came to Christ. And by the time I met him, he was a stable, responsible Christian, generous in spirit, good uh, communicator, very affirming of his employees. And when they talk to me about the Trinosaurus days, they now laugh about it. Because who he has become has put Christ on display in front of all of them and all of his clients. He and his wife go the second mile in everything that they do. And they have a wonderful reputation in that city. So it's not too late to let others see the transformation that can happen in us. I think I'm serious about the six compliments. And only one can be inside your home. But you ought to say something nice to one another at least once this week. Come on. But see if you can't get five more out there somewhere and look at how they respond. Would you stand? I have good news. The next message ain't anything like this. <laughs> Father, I set before us the challenge to notice and to speak. And I ask you, Lord, to open our eyes that we can see. Give to us, Lord, the right heart, the right spirit, the right words that we can infirm and, and encourage and to empower people in their service. Help us as bosses to look at these who work for us differently. Help us as those who are employees, Father, to see a way to change the atmosphere by changing who we are in the atmosphere. Let us reflect you in such a fashion that the whole thing is altered by your presence through us. Grant us, Holy Spirit, this grace, I pray, and let us have a compliment a day all this week and watch the wonder of transformation in someone else's heart, face, and attitude. I bless these, Lord, and all they represent, and ask that your grace would continue to attend us as you bring us more and more into conformity with the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you need prayer, we're happy to pray for you here at the altar. If you're our first-time guest, we invite you to the hospitality room just to the left of the exit in the lobby. We encourage you to greet one another.